Good morning. All right. This is Miss Kennedy, and it is 7.15 on a lovely summer morning, and we're going to get started on Rachel Carson's The Sea Around Us. Now, you might notice that there's a lot of blank space behind me, and there's a reason for that, and it has nothing to do with Taylor Swift. Um, but we're starting at the beginning, blank, blank space, blank canvas. And I would like to mention a couple of things. First of all, Rachel Carson starts out with a quote from Genesis, which brings up the point that it is perfectly acceptable to have a faith belief system and a belief in science, but we'll talk about that in class. The second thing that I want to bring up is that in this section, this chapter of her book, she talks about the world and the universe being about two billion years old. That's because during her time in the early 1950s, uh, according to the data that they had, that was how old the universe was. And that brings up the point that science is not static. Science is something that changes over time. And especially nowadays with the amount of data that we have available to us with the internet and research across the globe, this is something that we have to keep in mind. Science isn't static. Science is something that changes over time. Okay, so we're going to get started on chapter one the gray beginnings. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Beginnings are apt to be shadowy, and so it is with the beginnings of that great mother of life, the sea. Many people have debated how and when the earth got its ocean, and it is not surprising that their explanations do not always agree. For the plain inescapable truth is that no one was there to see. And in the absence of eyewitness accounts, there's bound to be a certain amount of disagreement. So if I tell here the story of how the young planet Earth acquired an ocean, it must be a story pieced together from many sources and containing whole chapters, the details of which we can only imagine. The story is founded on the testimony of the Earth's most ancient rocks, which were young when the Earth was young. On the other evidence written on the face of the Earth's satellite, the Moon, and on hints contained in the history of the Sun and the whole universe of star-filled space. For although no man was there to witness this cosmic birth, the stars and the Moon and the rocks were there and indeed had much to do with the fact that there is an ocean. And I'm skipping the part about the two billion years old, we'll discuss it in class. The outer shell of the young earth must have been a good many million years changing from the liquid to the solid state. And it is believed that before this change was completed, an event of the greatest importance took place the formation of the moon. The next time you stand on a beach at night, watching the moon's bright path across the water, and conscious of the moon-drawn tides, remember that the moon itself may have been born of a great tidal wave of earthly substance torn off into space. And remember that if the moon was formed in this fashion, the event may have had much to do with the shaping of the ocean basins and the continents as we know them. There were tides in the new earth long before there was an ocean. Okay. Um, sorry, I lost my place. In response to the pull of the sun and the molten liquids of the Earth's whole surface rose in tides. 
Here's the earth twirling and twirling, molten hot. And then notice how a part of it bulges. These tides rolled unhindered around the globe and only gradually slackened and diminished as the earthly shell cooled, congealed, and hardened. Those who believe that the moon is a child of the earth say that during an early stage of the earth's development, something happened that caused this rolling viscid tide to gather speed and momentum and to rise to unimaginable heights. Apparently, the force that created these greatest tides the earth has ever known was the force of resonance. For at this time, the period of the solar tides had come to approach then equal the period of the free oscillation of the liquid earth. And so, every sun tide was given increased momentum by the push of the earth's oscillation. And each of these twice daily tides was larger than the one before. Physicists have calculated that after 500 years of such monstrous, steadily increasing tides, those on the side toward the sun became too high for stability. And a great wave was torn from the surface of the earth and hurled into space. But immediately, of course, the newly created satellite became subject to physical laws that set it spinning in an orbit of its own about the earth. This is what we call the moon. There are reasons for believing that this event took place after the Earth's crust had become slightly hardened instead of during the, the, its partly liquid state. There is to this day a great scar on the surface of the globe. This scar or depression holds the Pacific Ocean. According to some geophysicists, the floor of the Pacific is composed of basalt, the same substance of the Earth's middle layer, while all other ocean floors are within a layer of granite, which makes up most of the Earth's outer layer. Well, we immediately wonder what became of the Pacific's granite covering. And most convenient assumption is that it was torn away when the, moon, when the moon formed. There is supporting evidence. The mean density of the moon is much less than that of the Earth, 3.3 mm, compared to 5.5, suggesting that the moon took away none of the Earth's heavy iron ore, but that it is composed only of the granite and some of the basalt of the outer layers. The birth of the moon probably helped shape other regions of the world's oceans beside the Pacific. 